Good morning, everybody. We have assembled here for a book launch of um, Against NGOs, a critical perspective on civil society management and development. Uh, before we get started, I will be waiting for a few more seconds to allow more attendees to enter the room. So please just stay with us. Okay, let me get started. Um, so good morning to those of you who are with us in the Americas. Good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I am Associate Professor for International Affairs and Co-Director of the India-China Institute at the New School in New York. Um, I'll be the moderator of our panel today, which has been convened, as I noted, to launch and discuss the book Against NGOs, a critical perspective on civil society management and development, which is authored by my colleague, Nithi Srinivas. Um, it's a real pleasure and privilege to host this panel for Nithi, who's Associate Professor of Management at Milano School of Policy Management and Environment at the New School. Um, his research centers on social innovation and post-colonial studies and mobilizes critical theory to study management history, international development, mutual aid, ecological politics, and civic design. Um, I should note that Nidhi is a highly unusual and extraordinary professor of management because he does not propound management studies in any typical fashion. Uh, rather, he studies it critically while being immersed in many other disciplines. Um, his work has always been marked as being at intersections. Um, and this approach of thinking across sections and intersections of disciplines or fields is displayed in this truly remarkable book that we'll be discussing today. Um, Nidhi publishes widely and has received several fellowships, including from Erasmus Mundus and the BRICS Policy Center. He has served as visiting professor at the ITC ILO in Turin, at the Hito Subashi University in Tokyo, at Sao Paulo School of Business Administration in Brazil, at the IIM, the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore and Calcutta. Um, I should also note that he was one of the earliest fellows of the India-China Institute, so he's one of us. Um, let me also take a minute now to introduce our other panelists, whom we are very lucky to have with us today. Um, Alf Nelson is Professor of Sociology at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, he's a scholar of social movements, political economy, and global development. Uh, he has researched and written extensively most recently on the relationship between social movements, state formation and political economy in India, um, and a range of conceptual issues related to the study of social movements, historical capitalism and global development. So in some ways it's an intersection. We couldn't have found an, a better interlocutor for Nidhi's book given Alt's interests. Um, Alt's most recent book, Adivasis and the State, Subalternity and Citizenship, in India's Bheel Heartland was published with the Cambridge University Press. Our final panelist who we are very glad to have here is Suchitra Vijayan. She is a writer, activist, and photographer working across oral history, state violence, and visual storytelling. Um, she is the author of the book, Midnight's Borders, A People's History of Modern India, which was published with Melville House. Um, when I was reading her biography, I feel as if she's somebody who's had many lives. Uh, her essays, photographs, and interviews have appeared in the Washington Post, GQ, The Nation, The Boston Review, and many other publications. Uh, she's also had a career as an attorney when she previously worked for the UN War Crimes Tribunals in Yugoslavia and Rwanda before co-founding the Resettlement Legal Aid Project in Cairo, which gives legal aid to Iraqi refugees. Um, as a graduate student at Yale, she researched and documented stories of, along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border and was embedded with the US forces in Afghanistan. Um, in addition, she's a founder and executive director of the Polis Project, which is a hybrid research journalism organization. 
So we are very lucky to have this diverse, fascinating panel to discuss Nidhi's book. Um, maybe I'll say a word about the book before handing it over to Nidhi. Um, it is a provocatively titled book, which intentionally challenges many of our prior notions of the fields of development and management. Um, the book takes on a really ambitious task of simultaneously examining the trajectories of the fields of management, development aid, and civil society, and situating these parallel trajectories across historical stages of global capitalism. Um, so this is no small task he sets out for himself. And indeed, one implicit argument in the book is that one cannot understand the affinities and overlaps within the fields of management and development aid unless one twins them and reads them together. Um, and nowhere is this overlap manifest itself more vividly than in the NGO, which simultaneously becomes a deliverer of services, a vehicle for an ethos of entrepreneurship, an intermediary between the government and the free market, while also capturing sentiments and struggles to be free of the state and the market. So the book is an intellect, impressive intellectual undertaking. I look forward to a lively discussion about it. I'll turn it over to Nithi and then I'll, followed by Suchitra, will be speaking. Um, one quick administrative note before I turn it over to Nithi. I want to note that the chat function is disabled for the audience, um, but we do encourage the audience members to put their questions in the Q&A box. And we'll take up those questions once the panelists have finished their presentations. Um, Nithi, over to you. Manjri, thank you very much for your introduction. I'm very honored that the India China Institute is hosting us for this event. And I'd like to thank uh, both our discussants, whose work I, I'm familiar with, for joining us. And I'm really looking forward to an interesting and exciting discussion. I have a set of slides, and I'm going to look a little uh, preoccupied only because I'm trying uh, very seriously to manage my time. Um, I'm assuming these slides are now visible, and I'm just going to quickly start with them. I'm going to use the time I have, which is approximately 20 minutes and no more, to briefly outline some of the arguments in my book. Um, I'm going to first tell you why I wrote it, because I, I do feel it's important to acknowledge the motivation for the book, and then give you a brief sense of the thematic scope of the book, the framework it uses for uh, critiquing NGOs, and then offer a kind of a conclusion. Um, I wrote this book because I actually, contrary to the title of this book, I'm greatly inspired by NGOs. In fact, I've listed three NGOs I've studied at some length uh, in my career as an academic. Uh, and all of these are deeply courageous organizations. Uh, they're not similar. One of them, the Timbuktu Collective, is what you might call as a social enterprise, started by two ex-Marxists in Anantapur district in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, another, the Galpao Plauzo, is based in Rio and actually works with corporations as well as the state. And the third is quite different from them. Uh, the Sidesi is based in the Chiapas region and actually is an auxiliary arm of the Zapatista movement and trained some of the Zapatistas. They're very different from each other, but they do have one thing in common. They all challenge taken for granted notions and they all find a way to, de to politicize what we might take for granted in the fields of work, family and society. You could say the shared refrain as organizations is that we have to create a better world. So these organizations inspire me. But over my research uh, on NGOs over about 30 years, what I have also noticed uh, is that the work of such NGOs is deeply obscured by a competing refrain, which is that non-state actors can somehow achieve uh, uh, development in ways that the state cannot, and that they can somehow square the circle, if you will, of market inequality through their own actions. I've rapidly come to the conclusion that NGOs are today technocrats par excellence, and that their existence as a figure, by this I mean to say not literally their existence as each and every NGO in the world, but their existence is a kind of a rhetorical uh, approach where we can gesture towards NGOs, that this kind of an approach essentially fragments the state further and encourages a kind of market discipline among the poor and among all of us in the world. My book is basically a historical account of how this has come about, how NGOs of today become uh, the technocrats par excellence in international development. 
Um, there are two uh, epigraphs in my book, and I briefly wish to signal these because I find them deeply inspiring. I've highlighted them on the left. Um, the first of these epigraphs, which is from Antonio Gramsci's early uh, uh, discussion of Torino, the city where he worked, uh, essentially reminds us that um, the way that any political change happens in society is through critique. And this kind of critique is a critique that's shaped through reflection, what, what in fact Gramsci calls his intelligent reflection. Uh, in one of his last interviews before he passed away far too soon, Cornelius Castoriadis, the French Greek uh, philosopher, uh, argued that he did believe in revolution, but this isn't something any one person could do, that it is something only people together as a multitude can achieve. Uh, and I find that particularly telling since in fact today we do expect NGOs in a certain sense to offer a kind of a quasi-revolution uh, of sorts. So what is the book's thematic scope? NGOs have become ubiquitous in development. They increasingly spread management ideas globally. My book addresses a set of questions about them. First, what does it mean to critique NGOs? Is this the same as criticizing them? Second, how do we understand the moment we're in at the mo at, at present? Um, by this, I mean literally this moment, uh, a moment when we're looking at rapid climate change, at a sort of a recognition of administrative failure globally in terms of tackling everything from the climate crisis to global pandemics. How do we conceptualize this moment for criticism? Third, how do we track NGOs in development historically? Do we see them as something that emerged sort of out of the box in the 80s or 90s? And if they existed earlier than that, how do we discuss it without in some way becoming anachronistic? Finally, what conclusions should we draw from this? Um, my book uses two devices from the empirical uh, traditions I was trained in. And I just briefly wish to signal these. One is narratives and the other are typologies. Um, I, in short, see my book as a hybrid between a historical work and what you might call as a social science work. And I very much see it as both. And I do wish to state this right at the start because a lot of my book is actually comprised of a set of narratives, which are then framed by a conceptual framework, which I'll turn to shortly. Well, look, very briefly, the common criticisms of NGOs, uh, we could argue that these criticisms are unfair. Uh, as I said right at the beginning, there are many NGOs that do good. Uh, three sets of criticisms have become quite commonplace. Let me briefly rehearse them. Uh, NGOs tend to work apart from each other. They cannot replicate the scale of the state or of large corporations, and therefore they can't achieve much. Sometimes they're also corrupt. Second, they work as a quasi-state and in this process end up weakening the actual state. This is an argument that's especially telling if you look at the country of Haiti, which after a devastating earthquake about a decade back has had a lot of NGOs work there, but their efforts seem to have actually weakened the state rather than strengthening it. And finally, the NGO work depoliticizes. There's a lot of good work, particularly in the area of Palestine that shows how social movements over time become rather more manageable entities that replicate an unjust social order by offering palliatives that uh, allow them to get funds from funders, but don't really achieve any tangible social good. Now, I, I think all these criticisms are quite valid. I just feel that they're insufficient because they tend to give us the impression we can dismiss NGOs. But if it's ins insufficient, what then is needed for a critical discussion of NGOs? What exactly could we say about the term itself? I'd begin by saying that the term NGOs is taken for granted. Whether we like them or not, we tend to act, believe we know what NGOs are. But critique in this sense cannot be only an evaluative view. I mean, critique has to signify something more. I would argue critique is a project of reconstruction. It's re-embedding in an object in its history and bringing out the structure of power that led to it actually coming into place. To put it another way, we should be asking how the NGO came about and what that term means conceptually and politically. This also means we should be asking what is it NGOs have done historically and how have they gone about it? And how have both of these, the acts that they've done and the ways they've achieved them, how have both of these changed historically? That's just another way of asking what is the development contribution of NGOs historically and what is the managerial efforts NGOs have committed to? 
to achieve these developmental contributions. And that's essentially what underlies my book, my eagerness to sort of understand how development theory and management theory created a kind of a, a, a space for a particular notion of civil society to emerge. Now, to explain this more clearly, let me turn to the framework I use in my book. And I recognize that some of what I'm now about to share may seem a little um, abstract, and I'll do my best to make this as clear as I can. To understand the role of NGOs in development, I think we first have to situate them within capitalism. We tend to take this for granted, but we do live in a capitalist world, and development historically and contemporaneously is shaped by that fact. To put it another way, we should be asking what is the ideological purpose NGOs serve in a market-based system? What do they do within a capitalist system? What do they achieve? Capitalism isn't just an economic system. It's also a social formation. It shapes our habits, our beliefs, so that we can generate markets, compete, and consume. And as capitalism expands, it generates various types of crises, some of which we can hopefully discuss more closely uh, in the question and answer, answer later. These crises lead to a problem of legitimacy. And in my book, I argue that this problem of legitimacy is shaped considerably by the work of NGOs at, at present. What NGOs do is a kind of ideational work. Let me explain what I mean by that term, ideational work. And very briefly, the images you see on the right are of authors who have inspired uh, my book and also this framework. The one author I haven't uh, shown an image of is Nancy Fraser, my colleague in the New School. And I just wish to acknowledge how with Gramsci, Wallerstein and her, this book is deeply shaped by their ideas. Uh, ideational work is essentially ways in which actors mobilize to either create a crisis or to avoid a crisis within a capitalist system. And in my book, I argue that there are struggles that happen across three domains of social con consensus. The first is a taken for granted view of the world that's very local and what we could call as common sense. A second is a group of uh, people, a group that shares a common sense of the world and which they use to pivot crises into crises of legitimacy. And finally, a uh, kind of a cherished truth that is held by a variety of groups and is therefore not contested. And I argue that these efforts take place through the intercession of civil society groups and disciplinary knowledge. Now, I'm going to say this very briefly, and I'm happy to expand on this later for interest of time. Let me give you a quick example. In the 60s, the Mont Pelerin group organized itself in Switzerland. It was led by Friedrich Hayek, and Hayek and the Mont Pelerin group contested Keynesian views of development and firmly believed that the free market was the best way to achieve prosperity and to the extent they cared for it, reduce equality, reduce inequality. They were mobilizing under realms of common sense. They were a group that shared a common view. And by the 1980s, their common view had become hegemonic. It was taken for granted across much of the world that the free market was the way to go and that the state could no longer attain development by itself. These were efforts led by the Montpellier group, a member of civil society, and it involved a particular reading of economics, shaping economics away from Keynesian views towards free market views. And so I would argue that what we're looking at here is actually credible historically. We have examples that do show how this works as ideational work. Um, and into illustration from my book is the shift from liberal capitalism to what we would call a state capitalism, essentially the period right after the Second World War. As I argue in my book, liberal capitalism was underlaid by colonialism, and therefore it withstood a very severe legitimacy crisis, which eventually led to World War I and, of course, to World War II. At the end of the Second World War, the stable frameworks offered by the Bretton Woods agreements allowed for a new a reconfiguration of international development, a highly influential one. And what is telling to me is how disciplinary knowledge rapidly followed. If you look at management history and international development, a lot of it is shaped by that period of modernization. So in my book, uh, as I have tables as well as discussion that track this framework across these different stages of capitalism, and I'm happy to discuss this further later, but let me now start to close by very briefly indicating to you what I see 
is an incredible critique of NGOs from a Gramscian perspective. Um, by the 1980s, uh, on, thanks to the Montpelerin group and the notion of the free market, we had something tellingly named as the Washington Consensus. It argued that the free market was the best way to go about development. We, if you look at the literature, that's also the time that the word NGO is actually used. Though the word has a history uh, within the UN, it acquired a particular resonance and pitch through the 1980s. That resonance and pitch was that NGOs could achieve something the state could not do. They could be entrepreneurial, they could generate democracy, but they could also achieve the state's goals more inexpensively. They became part of an ideational work, part of the common sense of how development could occur through both the market and the civic spirit. Various organized actors championed them and continued to champion them with variations through the 90s. And disciplinary knowledge rapidly followed. Within management, we have the bottom of the pyramid approach. Within international development, a variety of theorists argued why NGOs were invaluable. So as you can see, from a Gramscian perspective, NGOs are very much part of an ideational effort to buttress uh, a regime of financial capital. Let me then try to conclude uh, briefly uh, with a couple of observations. First, um, what I just told you, uh, if that is credible to you, would also explain to us why um, NGOs today are becoming highly criticized. We're no longer able to believe in financial capitalism. And since NGOs were cast as one of the key uh, actors within a model of financial capitalism, we're now grasping for straws, as it were, and thinking of how can we recast NGOs, improve them, reform them, or find another credible magic bullet that does what they're meant to do. And I would argue that if we do that, if we keep looking for these kinds of, shall I call them ideational straws, if we keep looking for them, what we'll end up doing is just defeating the purpose of this moment. The purpose of this moment is to look further. It is to look further than ideational straws. It's to recognize the profound crisis that financial capitalism has generated in the planet that we, that we function in. Historically, capitalism has had a capacity to forestall crises of accumulation. Possibly it can continue, but it is unclear at the moment how it'll withstand global warming, high levels of inequality globally, weak state controls. Uh, ob observations by a variety of scholars have said that capitalism is now literally eating itself. What is then required for a change in global common sense? A change would require perhaps returning to the credible realm of civil society, of recognizing that civil society as it is, is an ideal that is larger than the technocratic placeholder offered by NGOs. It is uh, telling to me that at this moment, despite their extraordinary differences, the countries of India and China have both in very similar ways weaponized the notion of NGOs and indeed weaponized the notion of civil society. Within India, this has led to a variety of attacks on NGOs, including ensuring that the NGOs that are tolerated by the current government in India are towing the, the line of the state. Within China, the government has always historically looked with grave suspicion at NGOs, but has encouraged social businesses, a variety of um, wildlife-oriented, eco ecology-oriented civil society groups provided they toe the line of the state. Despite their extraordinary differences in so many ways, it is striking that the notion of the NGO today plays a crucial purpose, ideological purpose, I would argue, in both of these countries. The future can't be just that. The future will have to be one, ideally, where we use civil society to recognize it as a realm for struggle to enable consent. And when doing so, also interrogate the disciplinary knowledge that we use that socializes taken for granted notions, notions that buttress and strengthen existing structures of power. It's only by critiquing both disciplinary knowledge and the way we see NGOs that we can actually cast civil society in another light and ideally respond credibly to the crises that, is, that are confronting us right now in the planet. Thank you very much. Should I... Uh... Jump in. I'll, that would be great. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Nidhi, for a, for a great presentation. And thanks for inviting me to comment on this book, which I've thoroughly enjoyed reading. 
Um, there's nothing quite like a good Gramscian take on, well, on all things really. Uh, so I, I genuinely appreciated the chance to uh, engage with this text. What I thought I'd do in terms of commentary is to uh, to offer three points. Uh, I'm going to start with a conceptual point, uh, and I want to move on to a conjunctural point specifically related uh, to the Indian context, which uh, Niti brought up uh, towards the end. And I'm then going to return again to a more sort of, um, well, to a point that's both conceptual and conjunctural, I suppose. Um, now, what I wanted to start with conceptually is perhaps Perhaps it's a bit of a quibble, but I hope it's a productive quibble uh, nonetheless. So it has to do with how we mobilize Gramscian uh, ways of thinking uh, to conceptualize uh, what NGOs are. Uh, and one of the great possibilities that I've always found in Gramscian's work, which makes it so appealing, which certainly makes it my sort of go to uh, for all things conceptual, uh, is the way in which it steers clear or Gramsci's work, his thinking steers clear very systematically uh, of binaries and binary distinctions and operates instead on a dialectical terrain. Uh, and one of the ways in which Gramsci did that, uh, which arguably you know, propelled his thinking uh, to insights that you can never really have through liberal understandings of what the state is, uh, is this notion of the integral state. Uh, I bring this up because Nitti's book uh, engages uh, exhaustively uh, with the concept of civil society. Uh, and in Gramsci's work, uh, civil society occupies a very central uh, place, indeed as an arena where hegemony is constructed, but also, and I think this is important, uh, as part of uh, state power. Uh, civil society for Gramsci was not uh, not the state. It was very much part of the state. Uh, civil society for Gra the state for Gramsci famously, uh, what he referred to as the integral state, was political society with civil society added. Uh, that is, in fact, what makes uh, you know civil society um, a key arena for uh, for the construction of hegemony. So my my quibble then becomes that rather than thinking of the emergence of NGOs uh, as a process that um, revolves around filling the space, if you will, that's left by a retreating state uh, in the transition from state capitalism to financialization or what some of us would call uh, neoliberalism, you very quickly get sort of uh, shoes thrown at you for using that word now because it's been so overused, but you know, whether it's neoliberalism, financial capitalism. I think rather than theorizing that uh, as sort of a filling of a gap left by a retreating state, I think we should think about it as um, as a part of, uh, you know, as, as one aspect of the remaking, if you will, uh, or the restructuring and the retooling uh, of what the state is and what it does, uh, by which I mean that I think that NGOs, uh, certainly in the global south, and also uh, we see this, uh, you know, uh, in the global north as well. Very often, we, we, you know, there are plenty of examples actually of of sort of of NGOs in a sense um, mimicking uh, interventions that have been pioneered in the global south now and in, in northern contexts, which is very interesting. Anyway, my point is that I think there's a lot to be said for thinking about the emergence of NGOs as a process that and and the sort of the, the dominant role that they've uh, assumed uh, within the world of development uh, as as part and parcel of a sort of, of a retooling of the state uh, and how the state operates rather than something that's separate for it from uh, from the state or filling out filling uh, filling up a gap uh, left by a retreating state uh, one of the virtues of doing that is of course uh, is of course uh, that of uh, of thinking about the state in a way that that contradicts neoliberal doctrines uh, to, con to, to contradict the, the foundational ne neoliberal claim uh, that markets are indeed markets, that it's about, uh, you know, where, where people truck and butter and exchange and so on, and that's it. Uh, you know, the erasure of the systematic use of political power to bring about the kind of capitalism that we have today, uh, just as, you know, the use of the political power of the state in its extended form has been integral 
uh, to the making of all historical faces of capitalism that you outline and, and, and engage with in your book. So uh, just a conceptual point to start with, that I think our critique of NGOs uh, need to start from, we need to start that by distancing ourselves from the idea that uh, this is something separate from the state, that it fills out a gap left by a retreating state, and instead said this is actually the state, uh, and how the state functions, uh, for better or for worse. Um, now, obviously, uh, this, this pushes me towards my second and more conjunctural point. Um, obviously, that line of thinking um, worked very well, would work very well uh, in the Indian context that we saw up until 2014. Uh, when, uh, and I'm thinking here of how the decade prior to the current regime in the Indian context, we saw the state actively incorporating uh, NGOs into policymaking processes. So, so it's, it's like, you sort of see it almost black and white, uh, how, you know, uh, how the sort of the retooling and retasking and restructuring of state power through what we know as NGOs, and they are very often NGOs, um, <clears throat> is being carried out. Uh, so there we are with our critique, and everything works really well. Uh, but then things change. You know, uh, things change to such an extent that the things that we use to critique uh, become things that we actually long for. You know, uh, it used to be easy in the Indian context from 2004 to 2014 to write critically and develop, you know, to develop critiques about how uh, the United Progressive Alliance regime used lawmaking as uh, a way of integrating uh, potential opponents, challengers, uh, social movements, activists, NGOs into, if you will, the process of, of, of governing uh, and seeking legitimacy for neoliberal capitalism in India. No longer so, because as Nidhi pointed out, uh, politics has changed so much. We have seen the emergence of an author authoritarian populist project, which, um, and this is my particular take on, on how to, to understand that turn, uh, represents uh, you know, an elite attempt to reconciling the very vast, uh, if you will, gulf that could potentially exist in the Indian context between accumulation on the one hand and legitimation on the other. And that reconciliation is affected through uh, the creation of a populist idiom uh, that singles out a significant other uh, as an ominous threat uh, and unites the people, uh, if you will, this, uh, the, the authentic Indian people in this, in this case, uh, behind a vociferous attack. Uh, on that author. And that author consists of several things, obviously. For one, it consists of uh, India's biggest uh, religious minority, by, by which I mean Indian Muslims, right? So that, that's a major component of uh, the other, of the authoritarian populism of, of the Modi regime. But you also have, as you pointed out, civil society and here NGOs, right, as a major part of that. Uh, <clears throat> dissenters, any kind of source of dissent, is treated as uh, that sort of ominous threatening other. So then my point becomes, what happens to the standpoint from which we criticize, uh, from which we critique, uh, when civil society, although it can very, very easily be thought of as being a constituent element of the state, is actually under attack, uh, is actually consistently uh, portrayed uh, as an enemy uh, of, of nation, if you will, uh, and is um, undermined by various strategies such as withdrawing FCRA permissions uh, and generally, uh, you know, uh, being consistently stigmatized in the public sphere by the powers that be. Uh, so my question, and it's, it's, it's really a question which I'd like to hear more of your thoughts on, Nikki, is how do we think about our critique then? You know, how, where, where do we, how do we reposition ourselves? Uh, in the context of these vastly authoritarian projects uh, that, you know, turn what used to be the objects of our critiques uh, into uh, targets of attack. How do we then relate to that? Uh, and this takes me to the third point that I wanted to raise, which has to do really, uh, and it's an extension of this, you advocate in your book and also in your, your presentation for a sort of reclaiming of civil society, uh, in a sense, and a rethinking of how it works. And, and I, I sympathize with that, uh, you know, uh, quite substantially. Um, but there's also here, I think, a necessity. And I think, you know, and it's something that I think uh, quite a lot about 
uh, of starting, you know, that rethinking uh, from a recognition that we will not be able to think an alternative, that we will not be able to reclaim civil society uh, in any meaningful way if, if we are assuming that we can somehow operate from outside of power that there is an authentic and pure space that is not entangled uh, in the kind of governing mechanisms that you uh, you know illustrate so in so much detail and with such great insight uh, in your book uh, rather and this takes me again to Gramsci uh, a lot of the work of reclaiming uh, spaces of potential dissent and opposition comes from, and I'm thinking here of, of, uh, of what Gramsci wrote uh, in uh, his notes on how to study subaltern groups. It comes through these sort of collective learning processes uh, where attempts to articulate opposition and dissent and counter hegemonic resistance is very much a process of, 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 of drawing institutions crafted for the production and reproduction of hegemony, of, of sort of drawing those out of their hegemonic functions and turning them to other uses, right? Uh, that's very often the lot, if you will, of, of, of subaltern social movements, of making weapons of resistance out of what is actually intended to function as tools of domination. So my question again then to you becomes, uh, if we agree on that, if we agree that the space outside of power does not exist, that we have to think our new oppositional politics from within power, trying to work our way out of that. How would we do it? And how would we relate to NGOs in that process uh, of working our way out, if you will, of hegemonizing institutions, uh, of crafting uh, a cl collective process for uh, a meaningful democratic emancipation? I think I'll stop there uh, before I rattle on for too long, all right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Al, for those absolutely fantastic, thoughtful comments. Um, let's just move on to Suchitra, and then we'll come to a common conversation. Suchitra. Thank you. I um, just want to start by uh, thanking everyone, thanking Navi for the invitation to be a part of this conversation and discussion, uh, Grace for making sure all of us are here together, um, and Manjuri and others for just, yeah, again, for this conversation. Um, maybe I, I think... A reflection of a good book is that it leaves you with more questions and provocations. Um, for me, what this book did, um, and I had some time to read and think about it, was really just raise more questions. Um, so let me start uh, at the beginning when you, uh, it really starts with the quote which asks, what is a revolutionary? And reading that, it's really about, the quote very specifically says that revolution as a transformation of institutions. <laughs> While I was reading that, it also became very clear that when we talk about um, places like India and other places that are being increasingly radically transformed, what you really see here is an authoritarian regime that is indeed radically transforming institutions, uh, but transforming institutions not for equality of people, dignity of people, but something that is completely different. So how does one then think about these spaces, these institutions, but also our capacity to define them and understand them? And often what I've felt in the last couple of years um, is also our own inability to define the processes that are happening in front of us, uh, our incapacity to define the beast, because I believe that it's important for us to define the beast in order to understand it, to fight it uh, long before we get to the idea of uh, reclamation. So one thing that I do want to go back to is how do we understand transformations not revolutionary transformations that are for the better, but transformations that are fundamentally remaking society as apartheid states. Um, within the context of India, we have remaking of institutions in a way in which while the constitution itself is not completely rewritten through a series of judgments and acts, enactments, um, in contravention of the founding principles of what was once a democratic and secular constitution, you're really seeing something that's being transformed in front of your eyes. In the case of Israel, uh, right now we have these protests. There is a very direct, after years of using um, the Israeli Supreme Courts and other judicial bodies uh, to fundamentally deny rights um, of various Palestinians, you now see a direct overhaul of a certain um, 
a direct confrontational declaration of an overall of institutions saying that now we are going to fundamentally remake what has already been in the process. It doesn't mean that any of these institutions were pro people. Now, how do we then understand the idea of transformations of institutions? And how do we then relate that to the idea of what we think about um, the civil societies or NGOs that are part of, um, who in some ways become peripheries within the whole resistance movement? How does one resist? What then becomes the role of these organizations? The second thing that really came to my mind just as I started reading the book was you talk about this Pakistani man that you meet um, on the train. And reading that uh, took me to the idea of, I think your book fundamentally, while I don't think it directly re references it, it's also the question of citizenship. How do we understand the fundamental ideas of a transforming citizenship, which for all purposes, again, um, we no longer are citizens in the real sense, um, the transformation of citizenship to subjecthood, st stripping of the subjecthood to something else, and then this gradual erosion of um, what used to be citizenship is some, something that is we don't really quite understand where it is. Um, and I also just wanted to flag another book that might perhaps be of interest to you, which is also almost as old as me, which was written by my professor Barbara Harold Bond, um, Imposing Aid, Emergency Assistance to Refugees, which actually is a story of how, um, as a young anthropologist, she goes into these communities and writes a seething critique of how the refugee humanitarian industry really works. What she really does is look at this entire industrial complex when she talks about industrial complex, the refugee industrial complex. And again, she's writing this in 1986. Uh, uh, it was written between 1983 and 1986. Um, what she really talks about is a deeply broken system and what she calls is like parasitically attached people who see themselves as saviorism. The ways in which um, the refugee figure itself is a figure that shouldn't exist and yet it exists, um, but yet you have entrepreneurs who mine these bodies and these crises in order to become saviors. Um, I really wished we, there was more, while you mentioned this saviorism, I think you mentioned the idea of saviors twice in the book, but I think there's also this idea of a lot of this transformation was also possible because of the saviorism that works within the NGO philanthropic world. And one of the things that I really wanted to think and go back to is the ways in which we have to begin to critique how we write about these institutions, write about these stories, uh, if there are better ways for us to do it. Um, of course, now the question happens, even if we do, is it really going to affect any real change? Because that is a conversation I think a lot of us um, struggle with. Uh, and you mentioned this in the beginning of the book as well, like the arguments and conversations that we are having might actually not reach, it's very possible that it might not reach someone like Kadir, and yet why are we having these conversations? What are the productive sites in which this um, these conversations can actually travel in a way in which that can um, then um, become useful for those actually on the front lines who might actually not see themselves as part of the NGOs or even the civil society, but some of them also see themselves as fighting the civil society in order for them to also reclaim a little bit of whatever space is now being occupied. Um, I also wanted to flag, um, you talk about corporate philanthropy, um, corporate philanthropy and the idea of a global resistance. And I really wanted to maybe flag this and something that we can discuss as we move forward is how the Gates Foundation, I think a couple of years ago, awarded Modi with an award. And it was this entire spectacle really tells us everything that we need to know. One about um, philanthropic capitalism as it exists today with the Gates Foundation, which has a long history of funding, um, uh, a lot of people don't know that the Gates Foundation is actually uh, pro-life um, and not pro-choice. And what they've consistently done across the world is fund projects and they genuinely believe, and this is not again, new information, they genuinely believe that the world's crisis and problems uh, are because more brown and black women have been children. So they directly fund projects that avoid stop uh, brown and black women from having more children. Um, this is just one aspect of it. Also, the, their investments in while they talk about uh, a green global world, they invest in coal, they invest in all kinds of destructive industries. They also played a key role in revamping the educational system in the United States. So if you really look at it, here what you have is a global powerful organization that has more money than most nation states who go on to enact um, public policies and services. And yet they've also co-opted the very people on the ground who are supposed to be helping 
being those, um, again, the word marginalized and vulnerable. And then now you have the same organization then giving an award to Narendra Modi um, for clean toilets, right? So this idea of the very spectacle and the circus that it creates. But the end of that conversation, there was, again, people questioned it, it happened, but the event went ahead. A few people stepped back, but then what does it then leave us with in terms of the award, the, um, the money, but also what happens later? Um, I don't want to go on <laughs> much longer because we don't have much, but I really wanted to kind of um, end with the idea of the last chapter, the emancipation, where does it then leave us? And I think that is, um, I think that is the one that we're all really uh, struggling with. For me, the idea is um, the destruction of the myths, right? You quote this um, thing where you talk about how does one escape utopias? Uh, for me, the question is how does one I don't know if we are escaping utopias, but I think what we really need to do is escape a kind of defeatism that I feel has really um, uh, infected uh, communities, uh, various uh, activists and other circles in India. Last year, me and uh, Francesca Rekia spent about, uh, we spent months doing field work with families of political prisoners in India to understand how through the lives of political prisoners, we understand how India is being transformed into an authoritarian state. Um, while working on this book, it became very clear that people asked, people were saying one thing over and over again. The civil society or what we call the civil society, uh, which included a, a wide range of activists, um, writers, lawyers, um, all saying that we are fighting the fire, but till the fire will consume us. And that left this vivid image of how they see themselves as fighting a fire till the fire consumed. And I think that is an important place for us to begin these productive conversations about what happens once the fire consumes all of us. Second is again, going back to the initial question of revolution as transformation. Here, every aspect of life is being transformed for the worse. When that happens, what kind of reclamation are we speaking about? Does this reclamation begin um, on the sites of violence? Does this reclamation begin elsewhere? Is it possible for us to even imagine a site, the reclamation in these sites of violence? Um, and then how do we then think about the broader, uh, the broader project of just human dignity? Because um, again, while you don't directly mention this, I think one of the ideas that really runs through the book is this question of human dignity. And how do we understand human dignity and the reclamation of human dignity in this process as we think through it? I will kind of, um, yeah, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you very much, Suchitra. Um, um, I mean, you have put like Alf, a lot of important questions on the table. And maybe Nidhi, the first thing we'll do is just give you the chance to uh, address the specific questions that Alf and Sujitra brought up. And I want to encourage the audience to put their questions in the Q&A box. And so we'll turn to those two. But Nidhi. Um, I, I really want to thank uh, Alf and Sujitra for these very, very thoughtful and uh, really generous comments on my, on my book. I, I worked on this book for some time and I'm in that sense, perhaps more aware of its flaws than uh, than than others and so i'm especially grateful to both of you for raising very credible uh, questions um, that i think really must be addressed i don't have good answers to any of these but let me from memory respond to them i've taken notes but if i look at the notes i'll just become distracted so alf in terms of the three things you raised um i very much agree with you about the notion of the integral state uh, my way of responding to it is through the discussion of hegemony in the book, uh, but I very much take your point. Uh, if we're going to discuss the integral state, then it's problematic for me to describe NGOs as a quasi-state. It would make more sense to see the NGOs and the government as part of an apparatus. And that has a lot of credibility, of course. I mean, you look at uh, BRAC, for instance, in Bangladesh. Uh, habitually, Bangladeshis talk about BRAC as the Sarkar as the government. Uh, 
They don't necessarily see BRAC as apart from the government, which is kind of intriguing. Uh, in parts of India, of course, uh, NGOs do function today in that way as well. So I, I agree with that entirely. I think what I would do then is to tease that out theoretically and try my best to steer away from the binaries that uh, Gramsci is so skillful at both creating and then steering away from. I mean, political society, civil society, but at the same time, finding a way to move past it. Uh, so I very much take that point and I would, I would try to strengthen that. Now, the second comment you made on conjunctural, on conjuncture, um, yes, of course. Uh, when I initially started work on the book, uh, I saw the Indian government as exactly as you described it, as co-opting civil society and finding ways to somehow have civil society become part of the flaws within the Indian state. Those flaws now seem extremely old-fashioned, uh, flaws of corruption, flaws of uh, clientelism, and so forth, flaws which, of course, continue. Uh, when I started my research, I rarely thought those flaws would include uh, becoming agents of genocide, finding ways of increasing hate speech, and finding ways of basically making Muslims, who are easily 10% of India's population, as a consistent other and as an enemy, which is, of course, what the Indian state does today. So I, I, I see what you, where you're going with this. I'm not convinced, however, that um, it's so dramatically different for the following reason. Uh, and, and please do respond to this. My, my view would be that in the, in the Manmohan Singh government uh, at that time, what was seen as civil society were willing NGOs that could work with the state. And what is seen as civil society today by the BJP are essentially reactionary right-wing groups that can work with the state. Uh, that is to say, they in different ways found uh, a manner of uh, alliance with willing groups of civil society. Whether they name them as NGOs or not is a very interesting and important question. But, but to me, uh, the fact that they continue to ally with civil society is, is, uh, is, is worth stating. Certainly, the Modi government uh, it demonizes NGOs. And certainly, the Manmohan Singh government celebrated them. But I would argue that ultimately both of them did it for the same reasons. That is to say, they saw them as accomplices or ways of allying with the state. So there are NGOs today in India registered as NGOs that do work with the Modi government. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, without going into too many details, I, I know some of them. I also know educational institutions in India where colleagues are deeply antipathic to the Modi government, but have found ways to make peace with it. So it could be argued that... Um, not a whole lot has changed that essentially organized civil society actors in an authoritarian setting as today find ways to work with the state and find ways to uh, move away from it where possible. Now, there was a third comment you made. I'm annoyed that I can't remember it, but give me a very brief moment. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Yes, indeed. Oh, it's a very, your third comment is, is a very fine one, Alpha, and, and a very difficult one for me to respond to. But uh, here's an effort. Um, I'm not arguing, though I do recognize I give that impression. I'm not arguing that the only space to challenge uh, the current capitalist moment is outside power. Uh, I, I very much believe that power is everywhere in the Foucauldian sense. So I, I cannot imagine a space that's outside power. Um, but your question then is very, very fair. How does one challenge this? How does one create an alternative or even bring out a form of an alternative when you're already immersed within that system of power? Um, I, I haven't discussed this at all in my book and I very much wish I had. I just literally uh, found it very hard at the end of the book to articulate this. But if I can articulate something hesitantly now, it would be this. There seem to me three ways one can do it. First, through uh, the fact that repetition is very difficult, that even a script followed again and again becomes very hard to follow in the same way. And so even in the, in the brutus sense, when you have an NGO that's an accomplice to an authoritarian state, it cannot do the same thing again and again in the same way all the time. At some point, it'll be checked, challenged. There may be inner dissensus. Uh, the second, that there will be NGOs that work with the state and are very well aware of what they're doing and are in that cynical sense able to play a game with the state, a limited game. 
For instance, one can imagine NGOs in India today that do not discuss human rights at all with, uh, with the state, but which do have members who are in different ways quietly pursuing projects involving human rights uh, monitoring, but don't call it that simply because they know it'll get them into trouble. And, and the third, there will be NGOs that directly confront the state and in fact, enjoy the confrontation. They may not be any more legally registered as NGOs. We may have to call them civil society actors. Uh, they may conveniently work with a variety of other political groups, uh, the CPIM, uh, the Congress. Uh, they may claim to be regional, uh, like in Telangana, the state I originate from. Uh, so there, there are a variety of ways they could play this out. But the overwhelming uh, picture this offers is not of an organized resistance, but of a fracture. And, and here, I think, is something that I picked up in one of your comments, I can't recall when, possibly on the integral state. What I see as particularly valuable about Gramsci's ideas is the ideas of how to respond in a fracture. We know the very famous quote of the interregnum and so on. So uh, it is the politics of the fracture. Uh, a fracture allows a possibility for people who are very different from each other to mobilize together. Um, and I think of Holloway in uh, Mexico, who's written about fractures, right? So when they mobilize together, they mobilize in a moment, opportunistically, but that mobilization can generate other unexpected consequences. So in the India of today, um, it is possible that there are people who claim to be Hindu right-wing uh, advocates, people who claim to have no views on politics, people who claim to be Muslim who may actually, hard as it seems, find a common platform even for a moment to mobilize together. And that can happen in a politics of fracture. And I find Gramsci helpful here because the notion of common sense, of course, uh, is meant to be that it is contradictory, that it is something builds on folk wisdom, but isn't necessarily true or untrue, but is mobilized as a truth by, by a group. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to ramble, so I'm going to stop here, but I'll thank you very much for your really, really thoughtful comments. Uh, Manjri, would you prefer that I respond to Suchitra now or wait for Alf to respond and then go ahead? What do you think is better? Why didn't you respond to Suchitra now and then okay. we'll get Alf back in? Yeah, go ahead. S Suchitra, I want to very, I, I, again, I'm, I'm just doing this from memory. I want to begin by responding to a quick uh, very quickly to a comment you made right at the beginning on the revolutionary transformation of institutions. Um, as, you, as you alluded, India is actually a very good example today of a revolutionary transformation of institutions. Uh, it's in fact a poster child for how to do it. It's just that revolutionary transformation is one that uh, I don't think any of us uh, in this panel uh, would champion. Uh, how does one go about it? Uh, I actually see the Modi government as a very useful primer in the baleful use, if you wish, of, a Gramscian, set, of Gramscian ideas. Uh, you, you'll know, of course, that Martin Jay in, uh, in California has uh, written on how uh, Gramscian ideas are today being used by the right. Uh, one of the more amusing, uh, uh, not amusing, but one of the more depressing ironies of the situation is the right seems to have learned certain aspects from Gramsci that the left perhaps could learn more. Um, you know, if I may say it that way. So one of those things is to transform common sense. Um, in India, since 1950, the Hindu right have been alive and well. I mean, let's face it, uh, they were directly implicated in the assassination of Mohandas Gandhi. They were closed down for some time, at least the, uh, the, the Jansang was, but then they were brought back. Uh, they've been alive and well. They were alive and well during the emergency. They formed the government for some time under Moraji Desai. Uh, they've been doing well. And it is fair to say that in very skillful ways, the people within the BJP have transformed local idioms, local perceptions, and found ways to connect them to what Alf right earlier talked about as a shared suspicion or hatred of the other. Um, I, I, I can't develop this argument much, much more closely, but my reliance on Gramsci partly is to argue uh, that in a country like India, which was created as a secular state, uh, a country that was created very explicitly to be a home for a variety of faiths and for people also not of a faith, that it is extraordinary uh, the extraordinary, it's extraordinary the level of change the BJP has achieved, particularly in its second uh, administration. Um, and in these ways, it does seem to be actually evoking what Gramsci called as a passive revolution, but not a passive revolution of the people, not a passive revolution of, the, of a distinct uh, subaltern class, but a passive revolution of an elite group 
that is able to mobilize and get the alliance of a set of different groups. Um, a very quick comment on, on what you said on the Gates Foundation and on citizenship and saviorism. Uh, I very much agree with your perception of the Gates Foundation. Um, and I, I, I'm struck by how much of the time, uh, both in my classes and outside it, we tend to look at philanthropic work uh, through a kind of a benevolent lens where we see it as somehow stripped away from politics. And I increasingly believe that this is a political effect and that it's a political effect shaped, especially by the field I was trained in, uh, management and business studies, because the field I was trained in tends to argue that we can always find a mode of efficacy outside politics. That is to say, we can find a way to achieve an organization's goals, but this achievement of an organization's goals doesn't have to hurt anyone because we all believe in the organization, you see, the worker does and the manager and the capitalist. It's just, obviously, I'm being ironic. Uh, the fact of the matter is management helps naturalize this sort of uh, notion of instrumentality. And I find that philanthropies, uh, philanthropic groups are very, very good at disseminating this particular notion. And there are NGOs, well-established NGOs, that are quite good at doing it as well. What it does lead to, interestingly enough, is a, is a sort of a, con a consequence within their organizations, uh, an organizational culture that does, not, uh, that does not tolerate dissensus, that encourages and emphasizes task compliance to the expense of a reflection on the goal of the, uh, of the task itself. Um, your comment on saviorism, I... Uh, I, I think that very much the, the philanthropic groups that I've studied, as well as the NGOs I've studied, very much believe that they were saviors. In my book, I, I spent some time talking of Oxfam, early Oxfam in uh, Tanzania. One of the shocking aspects of Oxfam's work at that time was that it actually encouraged Nairere's government to further collectivize villages that were uh, doing very well before and were now forced to become part of a socialist unit that not only destroyed their village life, but relocated them in one of the larger uh, forcible relocations of people uh, globally. Uh, finally, your comment uh, on um, citizenship. Um, I, I was very bothered by my conversation with Khadir, which you were kind enough to allude to, which, which I mentioned in my foreword. And I think what bothered me the most is I felt greatly ashamed. I felt it's wrong to live in a world where just through an accident of birth, some have privileges that others don't. And I find that intolerable. I found it intolerable then, I still do. Uh, all I can tell you and, and the audience is that I visit Europe regularly. Uh, I'm very fond of Italy and Greece. Uh, I'm shocked every time I visit how much Europe has become a fortress state and how the notion of citizenship is very much under attack. Uh, Europeans, including the Europeans who are my friends, believe firmly in a notion of citizenship that's expansive, that's inclusive, and that's um, ultimately ameliorative, that allows even the undocumented to become citizens. And then at the same time, the EU as such is building one of the most sophisticated surveillance mechanisms in the world to identify, monitor, and demean uh, undocumented migrants. In fact, they are so good at it that the United States is unable to match. It is one of the most oppressive surveillance mechanisms I know. So yes, I think citizenship is under attack. Um, there are other comments, but I'll keep them for now, Manjri. Uh, thank you very much, Sachitra and Al, for your comments. Nidhi, Nidhi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, before we take up a couple of the questions which are in the Q&A box, um, give Alf and then Suchitra a chance to just come back to what Nidhi said. Um, Alf, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm going to be very brief because, you know, uh, other folks get to speak uh, and I also don't want to derail this into, you know, we're supposed to be discussing the book, but just a quick quick, quick couple of of, uh, of comments on the, you know, the conjunctural side of things. First of all, I think Nidhi is absolutely right when, uh, I think you're absolutely right when you're saying that, you know, uh, you know, both the, the the UPA regime and the current regime uh, works, if you will, with NGOs and with civil society for very specific reasons, which is to constitute hegemony, uh, if you will. And, and I think that what you're saying here uh, reminds me of how tricky it is and how nimble we have to be in these discussions, because it's very easy, given how absolutely atrocious our current conjuncture is, to forget about, you know, uh, the downside, if you will, of what went before. You know, it, it, it's um, 
uh, it's very easy to to forget about green hunt it's very easy to forget about uh, a number of things that happened under the previous regime that uh, you know we used to be highly critical of uh, just going back 10 years in time right uh, and, and and that's just i think that's it's just a point about how we discuss these things which is that uh, you know it, it, i think it's incredibly important to not tie oneself to any particular sort of master principle here we have to be able to shift with this constantly shifting terrain and not lose sight also which also means not losing sight of how what uh, you know what existed before what was it was very much also hegemonic project and uh, in terms of you know uh, your point about Gramsci and and and, and sort of uh, Gramsci insights on on the right I mean I think uh, the, the current regime in India is a very good example of, a, of what I call a social movement from above that has burrowed its way through civil society for close to 100 years and have finally now advanced uh, to political society, if you will, uh, and seize that, uh, you know, with great strength, precisely because of that century of work that has been put in, in terms of uh, molding civil society, if you will. Uh, so I think that's a spot that that's spot on. And I think that's what makes the Modi regime very different from other authoritarian populist regimes. You know, it's it, it's wrong to call it the economy on Trump of the tropics because, you know, he invented the playbook long before they invented the playbook long before, you know, uh, they're not imitators. They're actually setting the bar for what's, you know, a, a really strong and resilient authoritarian populism is. We'll stop there. Um, no, I'm not going to take any more time. I think there are others who have questions, so I'll just I'll just leave it be at that. Yeah. So I mean, there are a couple of questions in the Q and A box that I do want us to turn to, uh, but maybe I can just jump in here and press a bit of what I think Alf you have been talking about. Um, so I mean, just on the point that you ended about how the Modi regime in some ways is not working off some prior template, they are not imitators, and I think one of the reasons why their project has been so effective is because they have drawn from a whole host of cultural and institutional resources um, that are from within. And so I guess in, in some ways, Nidhi, it's a question for you. I mean, you have in your book a critique of expertise um, and how disciplinary knowledge has developed to become a kind of you know, mechanism of not obfuscation, but justification for things that you are trying to critique. And I'm just wondering if there is also something here to be said about our kind of expertise and where we are drawing our frameworks from. And in the end, how effective they might be in producing alternatives and whether we should also be studying the way the right in India has produced alternatives by not drawing on Gramsci per se. Um, and I'm wondering whether there's some space here that we should be occupying by studying those like what people like Gandhi had said about the role of civil society and how to conceptualize it. Um, not in a binary of the state and civil society, but in a completely different way. And so I'm wondering what the role for our expertise here is in producing alternatives and whether we aren't complicit in the very critique that you're offering of expertise. Manjuri, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll respond to this in, in two ways, in three ways, if I may. Uh, I'll actually begin with a broad comment on expertise in India and the ways I see it as connected to the moment we're in now, uh, which I've described as a social movement from above. Uh, the second, a broader discussion of what expertise is. Uh, and third, return to Gandhi at, at the end. Um, I spend some of my time in, in India visiting a, a variety of business schools, and I studied in one myself. I did my... Uh, many years back, I did my graduate degree in management in a business school located in Bihar, what used to be Bihar and is today Jharkhand. Um, and so I, I just wanted to briefly say that what strikes me whenever I visit Indian uh, schools of this kind is that I'm, I'm, I interact with young, very intelligent people who are highly open to knowledge, extremely willing to be uh, challenged and are often quite impatient with the reasonably doctrinaire and limited approaches of their of their of teaching but have zero understanding or interest in the history or culture of the subcontinent 
Um, if you ask them, you know, about the partition, they probably will not remember it or know of it. If you ask them about, you know, the fact that India was created as a secular state, they won't see the significance of it. If you ask them what their views are of uh, the Adani group and their links to uh, Modi, they will be more interested in telling you the share prices and how they've shifted rather than discuss crony capitalism. Um, and this is something I find quite intriguing in, in the context of India. And it re leads me to a conclusion that, that's rather obvious, which is that the way, in a Gramscian sense, the way that the common sense of the right in India spreads from organized groups to become hegemonic is through these elite groups. And with these elite groups, the, the BJP and its advocates, they don't have to tell these elite groups, do you, please hate Muslims. They don't have to tell them, look, you're Hindus and be proud of it. They All they really need to do is to tell them, you know, let's steer out of politics. You know, let's keep politics out of this. Just do your work. And by the way, you know, your work is to maintain uh, our country and be proud of it. And that's sufficient for these elite groups to then buy into it. Um, it there is very rare uh, instances where in these elite institutions in India, uh, you will find groups that oppose the government vocally. And if they do so, they tend to be deeply uh, sanctioned for it. To give you one quick example, I think it's in IIT Madras that um, there was such an effort in the last uh, six months, as I recall, and it was immediately opposed by another group within the campus. Uh, without naming names, during this, uh, the Citizenship Amendment Act, there were protests held in different management schools in India. In some of them, they were very well attended, but rarely did they achieve uh, uh, any kind of visibility. And they were seen as a kind of a pressure valve that releases steam and then can be ignored. So the first response would be that expertise actually works very closely in India today with the emerging Hindu fascist state that, that India, uh, that, that, that is represented by Modi's uh, government. I, I forgive, forgive me if that seems inflammatory. I, I state it really as a statement of fact, uh, not, not as a statement of invective. Um, and this is deeply troubling because of course, India is a deeply uh, divided country that is socially unequal, uh, led by an elite that we uh, inherited through Nehruvian ideals not through the BJP. And this elite, Nehru's, uh, Nehru and his acolytes believed would steer our country in a particular direction. They believed this elite would represent all of our country. They would be guardians, if you wish, trustees, as I describe it in one of my chapters. Instead, they have shown themselves, uh, unsurprisingly, to be perfectly willing to skip all of that and just accede to the current uh, uh, dispensation. Um, so in terms of the second of these uh, comments, uh, I trained in a field that is a field of expertise par excellence. Uh, you know, if you uh, train in management and you're hired by a consultancy, you are expected in a set of slides, ideally 10, with a lot of figures and a lot of data to show where to cut costs, who to fire, who to keep, and why this is essential. Uh, you're expected to do all of this. The why this is essential is embedded within the uh, within the presentation I'm fictitiously uh, representing. Um, this is a form of expertise that is wonderful if you think of it. It is something like a doctor coming up to a person and saying, I can tell you exactly what's wrong with you and whether you will live or die over the next year. You know, we, this is oracular. I mean, it's extraordinary. You want to say to such a person, thank you for coming into my life. Please don't go. Now, forgive my irony, but you notice that this, of course, is entirely based on selective coll collection of facts, selective use of figures, and done on the basis of one of the various groups that represent a large corporation. In short, the shareholders, not even the shareholders, but the ones who represent them at best. This leads to a variety of sins that I would accuse management schools, business schools of being compliant in. But the greatest sin is the sin of neutrality, where they actually are not willing to say, this is where we stand. And that's a sin I cannot forgive them for. Because that is a sin that's common to a variety of fields of expertise. And I would think that at least in the case of management, they don't have a lot to lose. Political science, my God, it has everything to lose. Economics, presumably the market as it functions today might just collapse. If we recognize the fact that markets are constructed through state intercession and through the creation of you know, exchange rates, 
and through the selective uh, supply of money and the selective con uh, reduction of money within a market. In short, markets do not exist through an act of God, they exist through human beings and states. If we were to say this uh, as an economist today, it does lead to a certain challenge, right? So I would argue that a variety of fields have created forms of expertise and have benefited from them. But in the process, they've robbed us as a society of the capacity to engage with their expertise, engage with the vocabularies that have become impervious in that sense. Um, Mohandas Gandhi is, in my view, one of the most one of the most extraordinary thinkers on development and on expertise that, that the world has. Um, and I greatly admire his work. And one aspect of his work, which I've always found very stimulating is his arguments with Nehru. Uh, not enough is spoken about the fact that Nehru and Gandhi disagreed constantly. They did agree on certain things and maybe not on creditable things, but they did disagree on some very important things. In Hind Swaraj, the edition that Bhikkhu, uh, that, sorry, that Anthony Parel published for Cambridge, uh, which is a centenary edition, it actually concludes with some uh, letters that they exchanged. In one of those letters, uh, <laughs> uh, Gandhi explains categorically to Nehru that, you know, your notion of a socialist state just is not going to work. The future is going to be in the villages. The future is going to be with people who do not speak English. The future is going to be with people who are fundamentally based in areas where they cannot access expertise and the expertise that you claim that you can access for the growth of India. Uh, I should also add that before this letter begins with Gandhi actually saying uh, to Nehru, he says, I debated whether I should write this letter to you in English or in Hindustani, and I've decided to write it in the latter. It's telling that even in his response, Gandhi was thoughtful on what language he should use. To this letter, Nehru, who I greatly admire, responded rather witheringly by saying, you know, Bapu, your notions of a village republic are all in the past. What are you going to do about tuberculosis? Where are you going to get fertilizers? And so on and so forth. Now, I'm not going to argue here that Gandhi was right and Nehru was wrong. I actually can see the limitations in both of their views. But what is troubling is that in India, we lost the ability to have a dialogue on expertise between them. The closest is uh, groups like the Barefoot College in Rajasthan, which do have a kind of a vision of expertise that is grounded in local settings. Um, thanks partly to the business schools that Nehru uh, helped create, uh, and of course the engineering schools, what we have inherited is a notion of expertise that is fundamentally un-Gandhian one that is very much about the Nehruvian ideal of a centralized state that is led by neutral people who are capable of achieving extraordinary things and docile citizens who will follow them in, in doing it. Um, there's an image, I'd just like to stop with this, of, um, of Nehru opening a dam in the Damodar project, which is I think the first hydroelectric dam, dam of its kind. He opens it with the help of a local tribal woman and she and he hold the levers together and pull it. That local tribal woman by the customs of her village was then excommunicated because she'd been in touch with a man and eventually was located in a relocation camp many, many decades later. Um, and even today on Twitter, you will find the Nehruvian uh, society, uh, one of them, circulates that image. They never name her. They never name her. They never give her a name. They never mention the tribe she's from. And they don't mention, may I say this is the crucial part, that her village and the villages of many of her community were inundated by that dam. In short, she was actually opening the levers to drown her own village. But she was a servant of Nehruvian modernity. And when we see this as experts, we should ask ourselves, is that what our expertise is for? And are we the best to judge? that expertise or the tribal communities themselves. Nidhi, thank you. I mean, there's a lot to be said in response to your comments, but I'm not going to take up the airspace right now and um, turn to some of the questions in the Q&A box. There's one about teaching that is actually very interesting, but maybe first we should just get out of the way what seems to be a question by a couple of the attendees, which is actually um, for Suchitra. And it's about your comment about the Gates Foundation being pro-life. And I think maybe you just want to clarify what you meant by that, because there are fine distinctions at play here. All right. Um, so the so 
the person who I, I don't have expertise in this, the person who's done work on this is Professor Kalpana Wilson, who talks extensively about the relationship between reproductive rights, the Hindutva project, and how the Modi, how the Gates Modi uh, relationship actually furthers it. Um, there, uh, Professor Kalpana Wilson argues, and she cites examples of how Melinda Gates's um, is against abortions, um, and again, the ways in which they think about abortions in relationship to contraceptives, which both they fund uh, the distribution to various communities. Um, so in that sense, I think what we are really talking about is the, the reproductive rights and how they think about it. So yes, Melinda Gates is openly on record having told um, that they, she's not pro-abortions, and this is something on record. Professor Kalpana Wilson talks about it. And this is within the framing of talking about the relationship between reproductive rights, philanthrocapitalism, and the much larger global conversations about what happens when large corporations try to uh, forge relationships with regimes that again go on to further a certain sense, uh, certain ideas of what it means. It's making decisions on behalf and for black and brown women. Um, of course, uh, someone talked about, I think, this Planned Parenthood. Uh, again, Planned Parenthood has also faced a lot of criticisms in terms of how they look at it. But the larger umbrella, of course, is the control of black bodies of black and brown women and also women from working communities. Um, and because the larger belief system that they hold, and that's why um, various types of reproductive justice conversations are important. Um, is to say that they do believe, and they've articulated many times that they do believe that the problem with the world as they see it is not um, racial capitalism or climate change or environmental justice. They genuinely believe that it's uh, people having more children. And they do believe that by stopping predominantly brown and black women from having children, more children is one of the ways. And that's why they invest extensively in contraceptives and distribution of contraceptives. Um, again, I am um, repeating what I've read and learned from Professor Kalpana Wilson's work and her work is in public domain and people are more than welcome to look, up, look it up um, and then again, uh, draw their contributions. Yeah, thank you, Suchitra, because I think in this, and you know, this is not a conversation about Gates and their stand on reproductive rights per se, but I think the context within which certain statements and interventions are executed is very important in trying to understand and then impute certain politics to that context. And I think you provide some of that, but there is, you know, it's it's a pretty messy um, field in this respect and the kind of extensive work that the foundation has done on maternal health and how that gets interpreted. But I do want to turn to at least three other questions that we have here. But the first one, Nidhi, is by our colleague, Joseph Heathcote. It's about teaching. Um, he says, thanks for this excellent overview of your book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. I feel like I've had enough long lunches to be very much on board. What I would like to ask is how we should teach this book, and what kind of seminars would you like to see it considered? How should it be framed? What would you want students to know and do after reading it that they did not know or do before? Uh, that's that's really very very fair and a very good question from Joseph. Uh, this book was actually shaped by my teaching in the New School, uh, and that's one of the reasons why at the beginning I actually thank possibly twenty students um, uh, among among others. And the reason I thank them is that uh, in my initial period in the New School, we had a nonprofit management program. Um, and I found that a lot of my students were deeply critical of how nonprofits both functioned and how they were defined. And they were quite sympathetic to the notion that nonprofit work should be politicized work and that its goal should be really to move communities towards shared conversations on social transformation and justice. Um, that then led me to start interrogating the notion of NGOs, that is nonprofits in an international context. And I created a course on NGOs. I had students who would ask a lot of questions in class. Many of them have been thanked. And as I've said in my acknowledgments, I thank them for raising questions which I still don't feel I've answered to my satisfaction. Well, so in terms of Joseph, your, your very fair question, um, 
I'm actually teaching this book this summer. I've been invited to be a visiting professor in Sao Paulo at their School of Public Policy at the Fundacion Getulio Vargas. And I'll be using this book as a textbook. Uh, I, it's an experiment. I didn't, I didn't write this book as a textbook. And so I don't really know to what extent I can use it as a textbook. But when I do this, I'm sort of eager to have the following if you wish, uh, pedagogical goals. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll achieve them, but here are the pedagogical goals. First, I want a dialogue to happen between management theory and development theory. Uh, there is no dialogue at the moment. Uh, anyone who studies management theory tends to read it as being about corporations, about markets, and about surviving and succeeding within a workplace. Rarely do they actually ask themselves, what is the developmental context in which this is happening? And, and that's a question one could pose anywhere, including in, in the context of advanced economies such as the United States. Uh, similarly, no one within international development would even bother discussing management. The field of international development has its own stratification. Economics holds a very high place. Anthropology increasingly does. Management doesn't. <laughs> and this is actually very amusing because there are some schools in Britain, for instance, which do teach international development and management together. And my colleagues in those schools always complain that that they as management faculty are not as well treated as international development faculty, including by the international development scholars. Now, whether that's true or not, it does show that there could be internal stratification. So the first thing I'd like is to actually have a dialogue where my students start to say, this is what management studies is about. This is what development studies is about. I see their connections. Linked to that is a second, which to me is really very important, which is that my students historicize what they see as theory. Uh, this is not meant to be pedantic, but to me, following Horkheimer, critical theory is historicizing traditional theory. That's what makes theory critical. But we don't take it as the word of God, but we recognize it as theory that emerged within a particular context. I say this somewhat reluctantly because I'm aware of what the phrase word of God may mean in some settings. Um, so this would mean, for instance, that we look at management theory historically and say, how has it changed over time? And how has it responded to changes in how people uh, respect their rights, what they expect of each other, what they expect of the market, what they expect of the state? and so on. Uh, how have workplaces changed? Much of management theory historically took for granted that it was written for white men, white heterosexual men. Today, we live in workplaces which globally are starting to acknowledge uh, a variety of races, sexualities, and genders. Uh, how does management theory then respond to it? So those are the kinds of questions I'd like to raise. A final pedagogical goal, and this is the hardest, would be to have students then sort of say, okay, what would I see as an alternative? Let's say they say an alternative would be a civil society group or an NGO. What would it do? How would it function? What would it achieve? Where would it be based? Uh, and linked to this third question, I would be very eager to have deeply contextual answers. I know a little bit about Brazil, not much. So if I have a student who says, I'd like to create uh, a lobby group in Brasilia, I'd ask, well, who does that lobby group represent? How are they heard within the Brazilian constitution? What are the loopholes in the constitution that will allow you to be heard? If they want to represent a group of indigenous people in the Amazonas, I would say, well, who are your colleagues who would support you? How would you respond to the loggers who these days, unfortunately, assassinate a lot of human rights activists? activists and so forth. That's basically what I would do. So in a nutshell, I'd ask them to look at interlinkages, historicize, and try to locate a context within which they could envisage an alternative kind of response. Thanks, Nidhi. So there are a couple of other questions. I know we are running out of time, but let me at least note them um, and then you can take on whatever you want to. So there's one question from an anonymous attendee saying soft Hindutva has been a feature of most rural development NGOs in India, and the functionality has been in resonance with a particular ideological stream in rather historical sense. How does this reconcile with Gramsci's stance Nidhi has emphasized? And then there is another question also from an anonymous attendee, which says, what happened to the power of the courts and judges in India, the rights movement in which many NGOs use legal and constitutional claims to courts with powerful outcomes? Would rights claims to courts work in your other cases, Mexico and Brazil, anywhere else? So 
Um, Mexico, Mexico, would, uh, would, we be, would we be able to go over over the time limit slightly? Sure. Why, yeah, why don't we take an extra five minutes? And okay. Thank you. Time I'll, time. I'll respond to the first question, then request you to briefly uh, uh, recite the second question to me again. But I'll sure. respond to the first. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give a stronger, longer response. This is a very important and interesting question. Um, I can only hope that soft Hindutva is um, a credible assertion because it, we all know rural NGOs that are in a wide swath of work they do. And it's hard to imagine all of them are uh, similar in their behavior. But let's say for argument's sake, they are. Let's say it is soft Hindutva across India from, uh, from Uttar Pradesh all the way to Th Tamil Nadu. Um, I would still argue that there is a room for leverage there where local uh, groups that are working with the NGO find pressure points where they can make the NGO respond to their demands. And the NGO will also ideologically find it very hard to be rigid in its position, simply because it has to be accountable to the local constituency. So in that sense, soft Hindutva may not be such a terrible thing. Soft Hindutva may end up weakening Hindutva overall. And soft Hindutva may actually create a credible space where Muslim groups in India find ways to articulate their demands and have a dialogue with Hindu extremists. And if that is the case, if that sort of dialogue is happening, that's precisely what Gramsci meant by the notion of taking common sense and making it a conception of the world. Uh, so I have really no problem with it. What I would love to do, if I have the skill to do it, would be to actually meet some of these leaders and speak about how their own notion of identity has changed over time and look at how they negotiate that identity with the people they serve. Because that, I think, is the promising arena to, to track such trends. Uh, the second question, Manjri, if I could just ask you to recite it again. Sure, Nidhi. And that was actually a really interesting answer to the question about soft Hindutva. And it goes back to something we were talking about um, with Alf earlier, about, you know, where do you kind of look for alternatives? How do you draw existing institutions out of a hegemonic fold? And I think your answer was really interesting on that front. But the other question that I had noted was what happens, and I think this question is really thinking about the role of lawyers, legal organizations, bars as part of civil society. And the question is what happened to the power of the courts and judges in India, the rights movement in which many NGOs use legal and constitutional claims to courts with powerful outcomes. Would rights claims to courts work in your other cases of Mexico, Brazil, et cetera? Um, the, uh, Alf described this uh, in some of his comments earlier. Uh, during the UP, the, during the Manmohan Singh government, the UPA government that existed in India till the BJP won uh, the election, um, there was a particular space for civil society activism, and it led to the enacting of a historic bill, the Right to Information Act. The Right to Information Act was enacted by an unlikely coalition of urban activists, elite bureaucrats, and um, village assemblies and women, rural women movements, largely based in North India, but with also some representation in Central and South India. So certainly at that time, the comment by by that that you just read out, Manjari, would make a lot of sense. The Indian courts did create some space for rights-based mechanisms that enacted, among other things, even somewhat extraordinary things like a right to employment, a right to med medical, a, uh, a right to medicine and to education, and so forth. Um, what is happening today in India is that the these kinds of advocates are threatened in some cases are outright assassinated. Uh, the Right to Information Act has been um, sort of reduced in its power considerably. Uh, the Right to Employment Act has been essentially shelled. The Right to Education Act is meaningless. Uh, and the Indian government, as even the New York Times reported yesterday, has now developed a strategy of weakening the, the judiciary so that the judiciary speaks closer to its own authoritarian and um, chauvinistic agenda. So I would argue that India is no longer a credible example where rights-based agendas are inserted into a discussion and to find a way to enact development. Uh, I don't know enough about Mexico and Brazil in this context to respond. I would say what little I know of Brazil, one of the interesting aspects during the Bolsonaro regime is that the judiciary was actually quite independent uh, in many ways from Bolsonaro. 
and probably it will remain independent in some ways from Lula. In Brazil, the judiciary does seem to be see itself quite seriously as the guardian of the of, of the constitution. Uh, Mexico may in some ways be somewhat similar to India. Um, uh, Obrador AMLO is very much a populist, and he is certainly eager to weaken, I think, a lot of the judiciary to heed his own agenda in some ways. Uh, in my book, in one of my chapters, I'm rather critical of the way that um, rights-based development groups function. And so I'm not convinced, even if today India had a different kind of state, that rights-based development and the enacting of rights would be sufficient in terms of guarding it. One final comment, very briefly, Manjuri, in the time we have, uh, I just wanted to briefly add to what you said earlier. Uh, I very much believe that the only way forward is a kind of politics of consensus building where fragmentary, perhaps contradictory forms of common sense, even antipathic forms of common sense are somehow stitched, if I may use that word, ugly word, stitched together into a kind of a, a framework for political change. And we don't know what that future framework would look like. It could indeed be soft Hindutva, and I have to be willing to accept that because I'm eager to observe it and I'm eager to find ways that lead us forward to in projects of social dignity and social mobility. And so I can't argue, despite my own political uh, disinclination, I can't argue that that isn't a credible way forward. Uh, it's something we'll have to see on the ground. For it to be credible, it would have to be inclusive. And that's really the key question. In what ways a project of inclusion can be brought together in a vocabulary that is otherwise exclusionary? Yeah, Nidhi, I think that's a perfect note to end on because it gives us so much to chew on. Um, but let me take this opportunity to thank you for your time and effort and your thoughtful, insightful remarks and for your book, which everybody should read. Um, and also the panelists, um, Suchitra Vijayan, thank you very much, and Alf Nelson, who unfortunately had to leave for another commitment, um, but in absentia, I'm thanking him. Um, I also want to acknowledge my co-director at ICI, Mark Fraser, Michael Evans at IT, who's always superb in ensuring these things work seamlessly, um, the India-China Institute's team led by Grace Ho, Anna V, and others, um, and finally, a big thank you to the audience for joining us uh, from different corners of the world. So, till next time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>